I think the com the commentary in the appendix of my volume is the same as what's in the decree. No. No, that 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 commentary. That's the actual. Uh, that's actually him giving the um, the speech because at least in in the actual book. You don't get the speech in the lecture that uh, Hippolyte gives. It's put in the appendix. Yeah, that's. But I read that in the appendix. Yeah, but no, like the the two responses for, from this one is an introduction, and then the other one is a response, and um, that's Lacan writing about uh, Jean Hippolyte's commentary. In. So this is a third thing that's in the Ukraine. Yeah, and, and and so he pretty much gives this uh, these two uh, commentary responses um, during the year that this happened. So he gave it like right after, like probably like somewhere within that year. Oh, uh, I should have read what what's in the Ukraine too then. But no, that's good. You read that. Yeah, I I did my research with that the Alenka uh, Zupancic yeah uh, lecture as terrible as the audio was that was very enlightening yes so yeah you got that really and then it. I, i've been digging a lot of uh what's his name the uh, donald carveth dude that canadian uh object relations psychoanalyst because like even though like that's the along the lines of like melanie klein and a couple other people he's like he's really like adamant about like uh knowing when Freud is useful and then when Freud isn't and to the most part it's just like I would say the same thing that like his critique of Freud would be the same kind of critique that Lacan would and I feel like when he's talking about Freud he's also implying Lacan but I he doesn't mention Lacan enough but he has mentioned that like once you read Lacan you'll never read uh Freud the same even if you're not a Lacanian or you don't agree with him the fact that his reading of, of Freud is just phenomenal. So he gives him credit like that, but he's like biased in the sense that he doesn't really see um, any use value in um, Lacan's like metapsychology for any therapy, therapy whatsoever. He's That's like, true. yeah, like, like uh, Kleinian. Um, he likes Otto Kernberg, who's like a really big popular figure um, in America for psychodynamic therapy and for merging psychoanalysis into um like psychiatry like with uh analyzing uh by bi uh not bipolar but uh borderlines like more in-depth borderline personality i still need to watch the lecture you shared with me on yeah transference i've been it, yeah, it's really that. helped me break things down because he's bringing it down and they're, they're clinicians so they're actually like bringing it to light, like not like in the sense like what most people are used to in our in our circle, like um, you know Zizekian, um, you know only his Zupancic, like overly abstract philosophy or like you know political theory. Yeah, that's why I think we make a good pair because you're very interested in philosophy, obviously, but I'm primarily trying to connect this with those channels whereas you actually want to practice this stuff so i think together we can crack the code so to speak but uh, i love this chapter as difficult as it was no oh, yeah it's good and like it's like the more i read it the more and i understand it, the more i appreciate it and that's i realize why you have to go back to the source and and read read Lacan and read Freud through Lacan I think is necessary because as much as I have read in as many lectures as I've listened to from people like Zizek and Zupancic and other thinkers and they they're greatly helpful there's nothing like getting it from the horse's mouth yeah and, and they're like and what they're saying is like read Lacan but when you read Lacan you for the most part besides what he brings to the table with his theory of desire sexuation symptom um the four discourses or even the five or like um just like the what he focuses on four fundamental concepts he's like go to freud and and the more you read freud it's like you're seeing it in these different lenses 
these different spectacles that are not like outside the text, but like allowing you to read through the text in the text and allowing you to actually engage with these concepts rather than idealize the man or hate the man just because of, you know, whatever interpretation you got of him from like, you know, senior year of high school, of like psych 101 or college where they just brush over and be like, yeah, Floyd was a smart dude, but he just loved his mother way too much. <laughs> Which is ironic because you're just applying his own concepts to his life as if yeah. it's like, gotcha. And it's yeah. like, well, no, you're the one who's got because you wouldn't yeah. even think that if it weren't for him. Exactly. So like, what the fuck? But what's interesting about this is people say, well, you need some footing in Freud before you tackle Lacan. And that's true to a degree, but I'm actually happy because I, I, I've read some Freud, not a great deal, but uh, I would say enough, yeah. you know, civilization is discontents. And I think it was like his introduction to psychoanalysis beyond the pleasure principle and some other texts, but I, and I will like one day dedicate myself to reading as much of his work as I can, but I'm happy that I'm coming at it from this angle. Same. It really same. frames it in a way that is very useful. And I think what's interesting is maybe it's true. Like we can't say for sure to what degree Lacan was the best psychoanalyst around, but it's like, it, it, you know, he's, he's an interesting beast because he's like, on the one hand, he, he acts as this bridge to Hegel via Zizek or Zizek via Hegel, however you want to put it. Yeah. And on the other hand, he frames Freud beautifully in a way that no other thinker or analyst ever has. So he has this like multifaceted role. Him on his own Lacanianism, it's hard to say if that's even a thing or not. Yeah, right? So maybe your guy is 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 right about that. Car What's his name? Car Carveth? Car uh, Donald Carveth. Yeah, so may maybe a lot of these people are right to kind of like, well, not right, but keeping their distance from Lacan, like maybe it, it, there's some purpose to that because you don't necessarily want to call yourself a Lacanian. I mean, there yeah. are Lacanian psychoanalysts, but it's a precarious place to be, I feel like. And, 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 and it, I would definitely agree in the sense it's like, it's, it's, and it's not something that is just like intrinsically Lacanian. I think it's just because of, again, like how really in depth his reading was. It's like one of those things. It's like, well, uh, again, it's it's like the thing that Dave and I always talk about when it comes to Marx, and uh, not Marx, Marxism, and and all those that come after. It's like, well you know, especially with MLMs, it's like, oh, you don't need to read Marx because Lenin read, wrote, uh, read Marx, so we don't have to. And then Mao is like, you know, oh, I read uh, Lenin, you know, Marx, and even a little bit of Hegel, so you don't have to type things. So it's like, oh, we don't need to read Freud. We don't need to read uh, Jean-Paul Sartre or any of the phenomenology guys because, you know, or, or um, Marcel Mauss, uh, Fernando Sussur, because they read all those guys. Uh, he read all of them. He read Melanie Klein and Anna Freud. And so he critiques them and he, he uh, you know, retains a little bit on, on traversing the fantasy and, and the relationship of fantasy and the child development with objects in Melanie Klein. So we don't have to do any of that. It's like, no, you should because you're in the tradition of psychoanalysis because you're a clinician. And, and at the end of the day, what you're putting into practice, even though you're focusing more on language it's still Freudian. You, you know? know, what's funny is it's almost as if the assumption is that, it, that these thinkers that cap off this process have successively sublated yeah. the former thinkers. Just like, oh, well, if you're going to say you don't need to read Hegel, if you're going to read Marx, then it's like, well, then Hegel or, or Marx sublated Hegel in a sense. It's like, no, that that's a fallacy, and that's where Zizek comes in to like disentangle. The and it, it also means it's like it's like what aspect of sublation are they talking about? Are they talking about they overcame him, or that it retroactively reduced back? Like, well, that that was the that that's the word that I used just to a tie in. No, with, and, with, and that's good because like, like it's I don't a play know. on words because because yeah. that's what Hegel realized that sublation was a play on words. 
and we will see like how sublation or al Kabon manifest in this text too, which I thought was pretty interesting. And like right. now we're bringing up Hegel too, and yeah. we're actually it's really, it's really cool because it anticipates everything, the the entire sphere of thinking that we're engaged with that we're fascinated by is like I feel like right here we see the real nucleus of it yeah so I think, I think there is this sort of uh very nine with these uh camps that want to like once they get to the heart of their technique they have to disavow it and that's actually in the footnote I don't know if yours has footnotes but mm -hmm. I was saying how like denegation or very nine at least in um the the, the footnote was given about the commentary that Hippolyte gave that there there's also this uh connection with the term disavowal which we you know you how we were talking about the other night that you know I was using this term a lot and not realizing oh shit it has relation to for but that does make sense yeah and hopefully we can relate it back to that there's a lot here so I, I don't want to linger too long on any one thing because we have to jump ahead to Ippolit's own yeah. essay there, or I mean, commentary, I should say. So um, th this is just the recap. You know, we've been talking about resistance. By now we've talked about it ad nauseum. We know, we kind of understand what resistance is. I, it took me a long time to realize what the framing of all of the, th this is the difficult thing about this seminar is like trying to understand what the framing is because obviously it's like the seminar wasn't necessarily for public consumption, but for the, you know, it was yeah. uh, carried out for the benefit of other analysts. And there are a lot of presuppositions here that aren't necessarily exploded. And we have, um, you know, this discussion of resistance, which the great insight that he comes to is that uh, resistance is not something to be resisted. Resistance yeah. is the absolute gateway to understanding the unconscious and dealing with it in the right way is crucial because otherwise we have this um, cementing of a, a, an ego that becomes reintegrated and nothing happens. And I think Lacan would go as far as to say that even something worse could happen to the subject than if they didn't go to analysis, if, if the ego and the ego symptom is like reinforced in this way. So I think that's also his intervention is to guard against um, these dangers too, which, cause he, he's a very dedicated psychoanalyst. So we're talking about resistance here, um, full speech, we yes. discussed what full speech is. That's when the subject emerges. That's when the unconscious emerges. It is the opposite of empty speech. Empty speech is pretty much what we do all the time. And, and then like, now that you've read a little bit of a fun function and field, like you kind of see now how this interplays. Cause this is, I think the, if not this one, the one before, which was ego and other, right? Where he first mentions uh, empty and full speech. Right. Yeah. That's where he first makes that distinction in the context of the transference, in the context of resistance. And he reminds us here that the dream or, or dream work, the analysis of the dream in the last instance, in the previous chapter, hinged on this one word channel, or in the case of Freud's Signorelli spiral, yeah. let's call it, hinged on this word air, and that we have this one vocable, this one is isolable element, yeah, the scrap. And it that really that was really enlightening for me because I, I always think like, damn, like I don't remember my dreams in depth. You know, some people will tell you their dreams in like long accounts of their dreams, and then this happened, this happened, and I had pretty vivid dreams, but I'm like, I don't remember enough of my dreams to feel like I could do real working through with an analyst, but he's like, no, actually in some sense, the less you remember, the, the more fruitful it is because we don't care what you actually dream. Yeah, because it's not about getting the accuracy, but it's like the working through with the language to be able to create an interpretation that definitely is meaningful. 
And you'll know it's meaningful because of the closer you get to it. And this is what we've been talking about. Like, cause yes, we've been beating uh, resistance and transference like, like a dead horse, but it's like the closer you get to the nucleus of repression, the, you know, the center, the, the, the ego uh, unco- or the unconscious, uh, not the ego, the unconscious, but the more resistance literally functions and just like maximizes itself because of, of how deep you're going in, you know, that, because with most dreams, right, you do remember, and, and at some level, you can interpret what you remember, or even if you remember a lot of the dream, there might not be some type of, um, you know, unconscious content that was latent that, you know, you you just didn't know and it was just purely repressed. It's like, you'll, you'll know and you'll have a, uh, you know, a superficial interpretation because it's superficial. You know, to, to, to see that base value isn't a bad thing to try to see as some inherent meaning within like the certain symbols in there or like people, like it's just to fall into the same context. And this is why like Zizek, when he compares the commodity form to the dream function and its structure, it's to fall into like a commodity fetishism of the dream or in the Jungian sense, it's like dream symbols, right? There has to be some like inherent, like fetishistic charge for uh, transformation of the self. Like each uh, like monolithic archetypal aspect that reoccurs or just happens to occur in this dream has some like potent charge of like this thing in itself that needs to be integrated into the conscious day. Like that's not what we're dealing with. Right. And that's exactly what is going to be addressed here. And it's easy to miss this. My first reading, I didn't understand it, but like doing some more research, I get it. And we're going to get up to the uh, point, but pretty much like how you, how I'm about, well, before we could continue, I'm about to, I'm about to commit some Bernie Nung. You don't have to read Young because I did it. <laughs> Thank you. That's, you're taking the most, <laughs> Uh, like hollow tip bullet for me right there because I, that's not. <laughs> I'd rather not read you if I can help it. Uh, I did see Star Wars, so oh yeah, I think I kind of get it. Yeah. Um, damn, that's a those are shots fired. All right, sorry, Jungian. <laughs> you can send all your uh, like Griffins. To- yeah, Empire Strikes <laughs> Back. Yeah, yeah, you went to Dagobah system. Yeah, that's reading Young right there. <laughs> they can send all their dragons, all the Jordan Peterson dragons. To- <laughs> but all right, so we have, we know, okay, so the ego is a defense. The ego is a misrecognition. Uh, and, and that is the point of trying to even identify countertransference, where it's like, it's such treacherous territory once you really come to the outer reaches of an interpretation where you think oh my gosh something dynamic and 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 uh crucial can happen at this point we're near a cure or a change or something a transformation in the subject and that's where you can really go wrong as an analyst because it's the thing that happens right after this revelation that's actually going to be of primal importance. So he's like, what he what did he tell? Uh, was it Hippolyte or no, it was the, the Z guy before he oh, said, yeah, he just just Z, Z in like a fucking, like the, whatever it is, a little star sign. Just, just Z asterisk. asterisk. That's his name. There you go. Like share. He says, don't get too excited. And that's, that's his warning to him. So we know this. We, t- we just talked about the dream a little bit. Um, I, I think we can kind of skip past here because it's just a recap. Here's where he says something interesting. He's trying to dispel another common assumption about the ego, which is that, oh, well, the meaning of words is sort of like, filtered through and registered by the ego and he says well we can admit that the ego like in a sense controls our motor activities but this is an interesting way to put is the ego the master of everything that these words harbor 
And he would say, definitely not. Yeah. Definitely not. And I think Freud knew that too, when realizing with like neurotic patients is patients and like the, the fact that like, in whatever illness they had never had any like physical causes for like their epilepsy and all these other types of like somatic physiological um you know effects and it's like this the aspects of their speech was like beyond their control you know beyond their obsessions and, and phantasmatic things like so and and since so far we're talking about or we could just assume that the patient, since it's a return to Freud, we haven't brought up anything about psychosis or anything. We're just focused on a subject that we could assume is structured in, in a neurotics discourse or an obsessional hysterics. Psychosis is going to momentarily play into this. Yes, it just not, not as that. much in this uh, text. So, you know, he's at pains to distinguish this, as he puts this symbolic system from the imaginary here. And he uses this really interesting concept of Verschlungenheit, if I said that correctly. Yeah. It's Something probably like a crisscrossing. Yeah. We're already getting some like early glimmers of what are, are going to be, you know, like math themes and diagrams and stuff and, and, and uh, topography of course, so that you can visualize these things. But we have this like idea of crisscrossing. And right, so far, I see, I wasn't sure if he had, uh, if he used signifier and signified yet, but in function and field, he does it. Yeah. Points use signifier and signified. So I, I think I might've earlier in an earlier session said he hasn't developed that yet, but- No, he did. And you'll yeah, see this later yeah. on in, in, in uh, when he talks about like um, uh, the locus of signification. And then, like, when he also brings up, like, the, uh, which I think is the same one, um, he brings up, uh, like, a, a, a seminal text from St. Uh, Augustine, the Magistro, which goes over on the importance of names and, and words and stuff like that. This is where he plays in the importance of the signifier and signified. Oh, is that where he introduces it, like, as the kind of essential? And in, in, in for this text, yeah, it's the more we get into like the text, the more you'll start to see the structuralism right now. It's like, he's still focused on the imaginary, even though he'll like later on introduce the symbolic or the importance of speech. Cause we're still on the phenomenology of speech. We haven't really gotten much in the structuralism of language, but again, like, like uh, function and field of, of speech and language, you know, is king. And like this shit is like queen pretty much. Like, he's like just that. like, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And it's called function and field. So we have this like field. If you think about crisscrossing, you can picture signifiers being connected by a crisscrossed wires in a large field in a sense. So it's like, this is what he wants to illustrate, I think, is that the symbolic system is a, a unending network, but all of these signifiers are interconnected so that when you have one, you have all of them. There is no isolated signifier. I think that's one thing that he really wants to emphasize here. Yeah. And that's what he says here, one with the totality. And I guess this is, Saussure would agree with him there, right? It possibly, I haven't read much of Saussure, so I wouldn't know how much, I think he kind of like, in a sense, tries to overcome that like strict binary of just like signifier and signified, but rather like introduces like the network or the chain that, that like there's this like referential upon each other. Like, right, no exactly. They're like interreferential, if that's a word, like mutually referential. And I really like, I highlighted this phrase because he says they're oppositional over determination. So we know that. It's a differential system. Yes. And the overdetermination, like, can you explain that, like, how, like, what he means by overdetermination? I think the fact that, like, the fact, like, I, I think overdetermination, because this sounds like a lot of, like, what I see, like, in Althusser and his, like, structuralism and Marxism, but I think it's, like, the fact that, uh, in some points, it tries to. I could be wrong about this because this still has me at, a, 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 um, you know, at like a tongue twister or not tongue twister, just like, you know, 
my thoughts are twisted, but if I had to like give an educated guess, it seems like overdetermination is the opposite of determination in the sense that like if you look at it dialectically, uh, determine that which is being determined will inevitably become its antithesis or it just it negates itself. But it seems like this overdetermination tries hard not to go towards its negation and then amplify that negative more. Or, or breed, breed the conditions for that, that negation. I thought of it as just more so in the everyday use of the word of just something having, you know, just being uh, supercharged with meaning. Yeah, but, I mean, it could, yeah, it, I mean, it could, it's just like. But the, what you're saying makes sense like, though, because that's, that's what you're talking about. Oh, okay. Like alternation between presence and absence is gonna be a big thing here. Yeah. And this dialectic is exactly what you just described there. So that's. Yeah, and if in like, it's over-determination of speech, of linguistic symbols. And for the most part, it seems like the ego will, I mean, maybe if he's, if it's re referring to the, the formation of the ego through language structure or the unconscious, but for the ego specifically, it'll like, with his resistances, try to overdetermine itself so that it doesn't fail into full speech. Well, you know what Chomsky says, language grows. Yes. <laughs> in a part of the brain. Yeah. And uh, apparently Lacan doesn't know anything about yeah. that stuff. So. Let's go with Chomsky on this one. Um, <laughs> let's see, but no, but seriously, it's like, it takes place at one in the same time in several registers, he says, infinitely beyond every intention that we put into it. That's big, like, you know, he's talking about intention, ambiguity, overdetermination, multiple registers. It's like, this is a kind of language that's slippery, it's intractable. We can't get our hands on it. It always eludes our grasp and says oh, yeah. more than we want it to essentially definitely, definitely and that's our that's our you know undoing in a sense it reminds me of this song do you know tom tom club no no i don't you know talking heads right yeah, yeah. so that was a uh, tom tom club was a group uh it was basically everybody from the talking heads except david byrne and they have a song called um wordy rapping hood that's very lacanian mm -hmm. and they're talking about how like everything words do and one of the lines is like you know they say words are working hard for you they say um who was it? tina way i think it's mouth or whatever the hell her name is she says uh but she says at one point words have always nearly hung me i'm pretty sure mm -hmm. And if that's not the line, then I'm then that's a Freudian misrecognition of the word. But like, you know, this idea that words could like hang you, yeah. like words can kill you, they can be your undoing. Yeah. And and no it's like, what mention is these words could also heal. So it's like language is not something that we have direct mastery over. But then like that's kind of funny. Then then uh DOS FX would be like the the psychotic, just like uh foreclosed it just like you know saying all this random shit but like it just it just sounds fire when they're when they're rapping <laughs> yeah i feel like a lot of the best rap might just be yeah uh, like foreclosure right <laughs> let me yeah. look at ghost face killer <laughs> ghost face i was just gonna say supreme clientele is like one of the greatest uh <laughs> monuments in art to like foreclosure like they're definitely a, just very free associative that's for sure ghost just said when like asked about that, <laughs> he was like no none of it means anything like i just wanted to rap random shit and it's like yeah fucking good on you you can dos but, fx peter piper i'm hyper than pinocchio's nose it's like what <laughs> don't but you can't linger on it He's, yeah yeah <laughs> so anyway uh I don't know, like there, there's so much anticipate anticipation here. This is kind of interesting. 
we talked about the totality of the symbolic system and he says that one of the things that is uh, sort of uh, symptomatic of just this approach to symbolization is that like, I never thought about this, but sometimes children say the most random words that you wouldn't expect them to like perhaps or not yet or like adverbs and stuff like that. And you yeah. think that they would just be using like uh, substantives, like he says, just like regular nouns, just to get at like the meat of a, you know, uh, clause. But like instead, it's like it's seem seemingly random some of the words they use, and that to him is uh, a a uh, testament to the totality of the system, and that's also one of the difficulties of like trying to metalinguistically analyze this stuff is that like once you're in language you're in language and you can't you can only imagine a mythical moment before yeah. you yeah and 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 that's the thing that like is very like if you read this this is definitely the opposite of Chomsky because he thinks that with language acquisition that you learn one word and then you slowly as you develop acquire more words and, and language language structures so that you could develop like a complexity or or just coherent way for and again, he's very much like thinking along the lines of this like crude epistemology, like of some type of innateism, but yet at the same time, like there's some type of empirical, like he tries to like synthesize like some empiricism with this like innate structure of it. Cause he is like in a sense an innateist, like, right. like, like this linguistic Cartesian for the most part. But what Lacan is saying is like, no, that's not the case. But when you have one word in the symbolic register, you're already in the totality of the, the, the machine of, you know, the symbolic order, which is like totally the opposite. Like, and it's where like, you know, you're, uh, you, you were using the thing about like, you know, children, you know, will use like some random adverb or just something it's just like, doesn't make sense. Like, I mean, you'll see it later on in like the wolf child, but let's take it like the most like mundane sense. It's like, uh, the baby like randomly just like first word is a curse word, you know? everybody's waiting for like, oh, are they going to say mommy? Are they going to say daddy? Whose name? It's like, no, they say shit. But that still implies that they said like the name of the father or the name of the mother, whoever curses the oh, most. That happened. That yeah. literally happened with my niece. <laughs> <laughs> she literally said. But it's, like you can say know, that. But like, know, that also. Yeah, that is implicit with the symbolic order because like they're implying, there's an implication of like the, the name of who says that word right yeah it, yeah yeah it's it's yeah. going to be attached to yeah the name. Function. and naming is a thing well i i don't know i don't know what to say about that that was bars that was bars <laughs> yeah yeah that, that 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 is crazy yeah so let's <laughs> talk about my niece and my no <laughs> but um no it's really fascinating i don't want to get hung up too much on chomsky but i was just like uh, watching him and you know the way he was talking about language again I'm, I'm sure he knows so much more than i do about oh yeah everything i'm not denying that but it's it's more like the way he presents it's like this could all everything we're talking about could be complete hokum yeah. but it would still be much more compelling and and, and the thing is yeah we're not we are than what he says because he's always like we have to do more research we have to find out people accumulate words like you do dollars yes uh, you know like slowly slow cumulative process of meanings and it's like ugh, I the, whole, it on my own. the whole thing of, of of like the way like his epistemological framework and just like a lot of just you know uh science simps like what, what did you say the other day uh fact simps like fact simps. Simps. <laughs> yeah that was, that was the best that shit had me dying but we could apply again for to this it's like yeah you could say this is like just about like oh you just got to accumulate more facts because we never know but it's like you're only looking at it at the, the small scale of just facts with a cap with, with a lowercase f but really trying to impose that there's facts with a capital f really is just what facts with a capital f is is some meta language but what what's being uh you know negated or put into negation or refusal is the groundwork of your underlying epistemological framework, which doesn't appeal to any meta language, but rather produced by some certain like 
you have to resort to a metaphor because acquisition, acquisition or acquiring, grabbing, that's not something literal or linguistic. That's literally a metaphor to describe, you know, piggyback off of like what, what the act that you're doing or that science is a discovery where we just have to, you know, uh, go through the world and discover what's hidden beyond the bushes or something like that. You know, not to say they actually say that, but the fact that science is a discovery, but like D&G would be like, no, science is a, a, a like, you know, the, the uh, creation of concepts is rather a productive act in a factory type thing. It's a productive synthesis or a productive assemblage. Right. And that's why, like you said perfectly, the, I, the metaphors that are employed by people like Lacan, by DNG, they, they're part and parcel with structuralism because the thing is, this the structure that's being outlined here is not necessarily correspondent to the way things actually are. It's like, wait a second, I can't see this network of signifiers. I can't, it is a metaphor that like, you, you're never going to encounter the network of signifiers you'll you'll never prove that yeah. it exists outside of you or that it exists outside of the metaphor that is being used in the moment of its explication the fact is this network these metaphors all of these images that are used are deliberately in many ways poetic and elusively poetic to illustrate let's say a state of affairs or a set of circumstances that will in some ways not orient you but almost disorient you right yes. depends yes. on and, and, what you make of it yeah and uh to take it away from like the science structuralism or like post-structuralist like thing in, in epistemology let's take it into the realm of the therapy like ego psychology uh mindfulness bros freaking <laughs> cbt simps like that you just gotta find your purpose, you know, or like you just haven't, you know, developed yourself, you know, the, the person that who you are inside, um, you know, all these little things that they try to do that don't, they don't realize are metaphors, right? The language that they're using and the fact that these certain things that like a therapist can use, because at the end of the day, like, even though other forms of therapy aren't using psychoanalytic methods, they aren't, uh, you know, engage with the transference, but at the same time, it's happening, even if they want to reject it, refuse psychoanalysis, it's happening no matter what, the patient is going to cling on to you. And there's some people that realize that like, you know, oh, you go to therapy, but yet you're not learning anything, or yet like you're still self-sabotaging yourself. It's like therapy to them is a catharsis to where they could uh, gain the recognition of their therapist. And, and that's the moment where they could like tell them, oh, you're a good person. You know, you just have automatic thoughts, you're fortune telling, you're, you're trying to predict the future and, and, and you're, you know, uh, that's what's triggering your anxiety. Again, trigger. Um, just Is like that all not this, a metaphor? Are these yes. not metaphors? Yes. Oh, and and then like just all, yeah, all oh, these other things which create more resistance and keep a coherent structure of this ego fantasy. It's just, it's just like reifying the narcissism and, and allowing it to get like stronger and stronger, stronger, have a better censorship of the, the unconscious, like a bigger buffer zone. But I, I also want to point out that all of the language that these like, yeah, fact simps or like empiricist bros are using supposedly, <laughs> it's also metaphorical. These are metaphors. They're just, you don't recognize them as such because they've entered general usage yeah but they're still metaphors so when you hear something like this and it sounds like offbeat or weird that's a good thing it's the, like it's but it's no different in the sense that it's like it's just a more poetic like embroidered sort of metaphor than you're used to as opposed yes. to what you encounter yes. what like you said with trigger like trigger is a metaphor yeah you know are you a gun no no it's like <laughs> But like the way that like things, the affects fire off and stuff and the way you react, it's like, yeah. Right, you get that. You think, oh, well, it's an apt metaphor. There's no reason this isn't any more or less, it's much more apt in my mind. But yes. when he plays with language and you know, Lacan's deliberately provocative at points. He understands the way he's going, his words are going to be received to a certain degree. And he deliberately provokes people and he plays with his own ideas. Yeah. 
and and that does but that only to me is a testament to like you know well i simp for him so what the fuck but like he's creative he's the, yeah. that's in, an important part whereas like well i'm not gonna get off on a thing but you, you know what i'm thinking like the way like we're starting to get into it and like i feel like like with certain aspects of this we like we like you said we've already like beat resistance and transference like a dead horse i feel like even though that's the case it's like it's always being put in different scenarios or interplay it's like he's a bad writer when it comes to his essays and stuff but i feel like because of his speaking and like how witty he is he probably would have been a great like literature writer like if he would have like applied like some psychoanalysis to like maybe like a story or something like that like like literature like just the way that he's able to like create a speech and just like poke at people and create controversy and and just be controversial and, and pretentious but at the same time when he's playing with these concepts he's always building it up and putting it in a different light it's like you think you already know what we're talking about because i beat it like a dead horse but look i'm gonna bring it in a new light and it's just like oh okay it's, it's a kind of like a build up or like a like a mobius strip like a, a loop around yeah i would love the comment on that but i i feel like then we would yeah we'd be just go down yeah. Uh, yeah. another hallway here so for nine um yes this is the topic of this seminar here for nine um, he says that Hippolyte you know points out that denegation yeah better than negation or yeah. however you're saying it um and Hippolyte himself although he, in his presentation is going to try to uh, distinguish between the two one of the footnotes says that he doesn't uh, he, he's not faithful to his own like distinction or he's like a little careless when it comes to distinguishing between the two but yeah. suffice it to say i mean we'll use these two words interchangeably i think we'll just call it negation right like mm -hmm. here i'm not exactly sure what the the subtle shade of difference is between yeah I, I i've never really understood it either but, uh, you know, okay, this is more of what we know, uh, ego, sp spoken manifestation of the subject in the session, it's defense, it's resistance. Um, there's not, this is, there's not too much here to say. I just highlighted this because it's funny to me. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually knew, thought you were going to highlight that too when I was reading it and I was like, that's funny. Affected <laughs> smoochy woochy. <laughs> smoochy woochy before. <laughs> you're not gonna get that in chomsky that's all i'm saying nah. <laughs> you don't get that low <laughs> um and I, I don't think there's is there anything else here no that, no you, are you gonna skip yeah yeah that's what i was thinking we'd do right go right to yeah. it's 295 here and we'll get into yeah this is some good stuff right here <laughs> This is really interesting. It's not very well organized, um, but it's really fascinating. I feel like here we see the first granule of, a, who knows, maybe we could, I, I don't wanna say this for certain off record, maybe we could credit Ippolite with, in some sense, uh, ushering in an entire era of Hegelian Lacanian thinking. It's the, this is the first glimmers of this kind of. It, it's actually. I, there, but. I was just going to bring this up because to the extent that he was kind of inspired by like his version of, of Hegelianism, because even though he has them in his seminars, like at least for the first two, I don't know how long he, he, he shows up like in any of the other ones, but. It's actually Alexander Kozhev who has a huge effect on Lacan's interpretation of Hegel. And Alexander Kozhev, he's like a Russian born, but then a uh, French emigrated scholar who specialized in Hegel and Marx. But it was his introduction into Hegel's phenomenology spirit, where he focuses a lot on recognition, master and slave dialectic, that this, like, is the predominant interpretation of him, um, of Hegel being him, uh, by people like Lacan, Sartre, Merleau-Ponty, 
uh, Deleuze and Derrida. But Derrida, Deleuze, and Foucault actually have more influence by Hippolyte himself. But I don't see a lot of like the Hippolyte style in Lacan, which is kind no, of no. No, I didn't mean to say that. No, not his style. Like yeah, more so. And I know we have to credit Cochet for all this, but the uh, this is the first time I'm seeing an attempt to sort of square Freud yeah. with Hegel and yes. uh, someone who's more learned than I am would know if that's been done before. But it's just interesting because I'm so familiar with reading Zizek and hearing him talk about Hegel and Lacan together that it's like it's fascinating to see this. I would say like there are attempts before this, but I would say they were kind of very crude attempts. And it's from the Frankfurt School, especially um, Herbert Marcuse, because he, he oh, okay. is himself a Hegelian. And then with Eros and Civilization, it's that Freudian, Marxist, Hegelian discourse. But again, it's nowhere along the lines of Lacan because, and with the way they're using, they're, they're only focused on like this crude, sociological way of applying repression and domination like and surplus repression like as if like the theory of desire or libido like equating with desire or drives couldn't really be a thing like it's, it's just really crude and i don't think it really tackles enough right and it's rooted in a very like uh elementary understanding of sexual difference and sexuality that yeah just like oh well society's issue is mass repression or i don't want to credit like i don't, I don't want to attribute yeah um, and, and, and you could see like elements of like you know we can continue on. i don't want to get too off of this but elements of wilhelm reich in, into that like, right. kind of interpretation with dmg definitely uh, like they love that aspect of oh, okay life. right they're they're into that yeah they like the yeah so uh again a lot of a lot of thank yous, a lot of, they, this uh, footnote's interesting because they, uh, is this Jacqueline who's writing this? Here? Yeah, yeah, it should be uh, Elaine Miller. So yeah, I'm talking like, as if I know him, uh, <laughs> Miller, I should say. <laughs> like I could do that with Slavoj because apparently he prefers that, but I don't know. But um, so, you know, he talks about how the, difference between denegation negation and the difficulty of translating this text because parts of it were in german and he, he's reading from a german text that's sometimes translated in french yes and of course it's in french it's a, so that it's very difficult to uh the, the translation itself uh but like i was saying before it's important to note that uh he's somewhat careless with switching from denegation to negation but uh because there are two orders of negation that we're going to talk about here and it's important to make the distinction at a certain point and yes yeah and i thought that was interesting too it's like an internal external one hopefully we'll we'll try to identify when it's like important to leap to the next stage of the distinction he's making but um anyway uh yeah this was this was tough but i i got a lot of secondary stuff that kind of like illuminated it for me but mm. uh it's it's really fascinating i read the the short text that he's drawing from negation yes by freud or verneinung by freud it's super short but as he mentions it's like it, it's so dense and so uh in its own way revolutionary that not only does it uh, shed light on the status of psychoanalysis but uh also like like he's saying because he believes a philosopher has decisive ramifications in the realm of philosophy itself yeah and, and, and it's that's actually something uh i'm glad you brought up because in the response by um lacan he like says um uh, I'll flip through it, but I'm just going to talk while I say it, like while I'm looking through it, that like, you know, even though Freud was coming at a time before, um, you know, um, like big as phenomenology got, and not only phenomenology, but existentialism in France, like 
um, it's like he almost like presupposes with this whole thing on negation, which you'll see a lot in like, um, he, he's like, this is like, because he's like still in his phenomenology kind of like um, lens or like where he's still kind of drawing from. And he draws upon like being, being in nothingness. Like he, he'll say like Freud, uh, what does he say? In this short text, as we, as in the whole of this work, Freud thus proves to be very far ahead of his time not at all lacking compared with most recent aspects of philosophical reflection. He does not in any way anticipate the modern development of philosophy of existence, but this philosophy is no, uh, no more than the parry that reveals in certain people and covers over in others more or less well understood repercussions of a meditation on being, which goes so far as to contest the whole tradition of our thought, believing it's to stem from a primordial confusion among other things, among other beings. And then, you know, he asked him um, brackets, uh, being in nothingness. So, yeah, that, so Lacan agrees with Hippolyte here that yeah. Hippolyte himself seems somewhat stupefied by what he's reading because it, uh, completely challenges what we're taking to be fundamental, like axiom axioms of of philosophy. Yeah, and you can still see this today with the way people, not only in philosophy but like in like other realms of discourse, like this just pure holistic rational subject with agency. And if there's you know we know for a fact in common discourse, like people will say it's just human nature, bro. Like, or like, you know, just humans are just naturally evil. And like any discourse, whether it's like their crude attempts of psychology and just like, you know, what makes somebody a murderer, a serial murderer or a pedophile because they watch all these things on like freaking, again, like the Ted, like how many fucking Ted Bundy documentaries do we need or, or Richard? Right. It's just like, they all of a sudden become profound thinkers. Like what just makes somebody's just so sick and sadistic of like that? It's just, yeah. <laughs> it's just, are we just naturally evil as humans? And it's like, still, there's just a presupposition on this that just makes it a totality of the subject and has this agency. And like, or like with science, just like the fact that like, we are just like, you know, this Aristotelian sense subject of this will to know, or just like this drive for knowledge purely you know, that science has this discourse. It's like, we're just like this blank slate subject. And then we're just purely observers of facts, but they don't apply for the split or this repression, negation, refusal aspect of something underlying. And th this, this is the clearing away of talk about bias training or whatever, the actual clearing away of biases yeah. be to be in Freud's position. Not that he's like perfectly objective or anything, no, but it's like not. this is, I mean, but that's what the dialectic itself is dealing with. And well, it, it's going to make a lot more sense, hopefully, when we explore this, but um, let's clear through some of the brush here. Okay, so again, this text from Freud, negation. He Freud begins with and, and he begins with what is already something that everybody knows, which is that like uh, someone says, now you'll think I mean to say something insulting, but really I have no such intention. I remember my, my mom used to say that my grandfather used to say, uh, no offense, but your feet stink, right? Yeah. It's like a corny thing. It's like, you know, but they are offended. Yeah. Otherwise, feel, it wouldn't be. A, yeah. I, I have no intention of telling you that your feet stink, but I just said it, right? So everybody knows that. Uh, and so Freud wants to point or, out. Or, or, I, I got a funny one. Would bros be like, no homo, but like. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No homo itself could be a topic of. Freud conjuring from his grave, like. Hmm. <laughs> I knew, I, I think Cameron is one of the greatest, his whole body of work is a great exemplification of so many <laughs> and I would love to dedicate my life to just 
analyzing the Dipset catalog, but well, later on, that'll be my swan song. Uh, so, and of course, I don't want to insult you. And then most people say, of course, that means I want to insult you. It does, you know, if you have a, a little bit of sense, that's what it'll, what it'll mean. What Freud wants to clarify here is that there's more to it than that. Yeah. We have to go a little bit farther and figure out what's really going on here because why present it in this form in the first place is the question mm -hmm. as a negative, not just to slip away from the uh, consequences of what you're saying. It's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, but, okay, so he talked about this famous example. Zizek uses it a lot, uh, and I listened to brilliant lecture of his where he happened to bring up for nine on randomly and it was about Lacan and sexual difference and uh, so just to say like th this is as philosophical as the seminar might get because it's like uh, this for nine on actually has a lot to do with his Hegelianism yeah. and uh, I'll try not to get too far into that but Zupancic the whole like Lubania school like this is a really pivotal point here. Mm -hmm. um, but the famous example is, of course, patient of Freud's who has a dream. He says, uh, he sees a woman in a dream and he says, you ask who this person in the dream can be. It's not my mother, God damn it. And <laughs> like, part of me wonders if he is saying that because he's like, this fucking Freud keeps going on about mothers this time it's not my mother i don't know if that plays into it all but i feel like there's always that how metapsychology in some ways is tied to the actual analytic experience but let's not get off on that it's not my mother what say you to that is it his mother or not <laughs> And then Freud, of course, he has a brilliant response, which is when you, uh, when you said that, right, what would you consider the most unlikely thing in this, that situation? What was the furthest from your mind? Now, if you did that today, talk to someone, they're going to be like, don't set these like little traps for me. It's yeah. It's a game. But if you're going to ask honestly, of course, it's going to be like, aha, that's what it was. That's the closest thing. Uh, I'm going to shut my camera off, but I got to do some real quick. Keep talking if you can. Sure. Yeah. So we're talking about a mode of being presented as what something isn't. So someone says, I am going to tell you what I am, pay attention. That is exactly, or I'm going to tell you what I am not, pay attention. That is exactly what I am. And anyone who thinks they're a little bit shrewd or knows a little bit of psychology, of course, is going to assume that that person, through this negation, is actually conjuring the thing the figure yeah. entity that's negated and i, I was yeah. like as you're going on like i'm thinking about when you're talking about the traps it just makes me think about the rat man and like how like this whole thing and again i mentioned this to you before but this like i think the rat man well you could probably find a lot of your nine on a lot of these cases but like that's something about the rat man one which is very phenomenal about like how he was just disavowing or just like he was negating like a lot of the stuff, but yet like he was just caught in that trap, you know, that Freud set. <laughs> rat traps, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And these are these are rat traps. And this is again, it it's always a two-way street with Lacan because he's talking to analysts and he's not just talking about what occurs with the analysan, but also what to look out for as an analyst. And I think that's part of the return to Freud is that. Freud gives you this beautiful first person account of what it is to be an analyst. You don't get that with other sciences, you know? No, or like it, psychology or like how psychology tries to affirm itself as a science, but like 
therapy may not be a science in the sense like something like hard science like biology or engineering or, or chemistry or something like that but it, it has its own craft and i just like there's just so much like but then again like you could tackle in so many ways like not just the fact that like you know just this flawed interpretation of Freud but it's the fact that therapy culture just uh, helps reinstate capitalism you know we don't need to look too far for anti-Oedipus yeah right and and anyone who really wants to be treated is, is going to without realizing it or not bump up against that kind of disavowal thing but let I, as much as I would love to talk about disavowal all day yeah. that this is it's so cool to see this word of hey bomb here because yeah. like, sublation is the thing. So yes. I'm gonna recuse myself here. And as someone who's read phenomenology, maybe you can tell us you were you explored it a little bit more before. This is huge. Like th th when I say this is the beginning of like of Slavoy, it's like it really is like all this stuff. Alf Hebung is everything. And and this is why I was like saying, like, you know, in the beginning of this the discussion when we were recording, it's like, yeah, we're bringing up the whole thing about like Hegel or like um the fact it's like um even in like rejecting of a system or rejecting of a thinker because like, oh, this person already read them and critiqued them, we don't have to, but they end up going back and reducing their theories to these problems that this thinker was attacking in the light of what we're talking about right here of Verneinung it's like Al Pebong doesn't necessarily mean to surpass or to overcome or to synthesize which is the whole point of this text negation or denegation whatever you want to call it but the fact that like what's being negated is this like attempt to uh, kind of mediate or to synthesize or and, and by synthesize it's the whole production of resistances trying to just create solidification or determine itself and it really ends up reducing it back down to this primordial contradiction this primordial not even contradiction of affirmation because the unconscious is the only thing that doesn't negate it affirms it has no sense of life or death or time or whatever and so this is like the deformation of the the so-called empty speech into the full speech which only could occur at this point of deformation and what it, like again we shouldn't see al Pabon as this like progressive overcoming it's like this further negative of peeling back and just seeing contradiction at its tightest these resistances and struggle at its most manifested and that even when it sees it it has no point but to resist and negate that lest it freaking you know expose the patient the patient is like literally caught in you know the reality of what their fantasy means to them or their relationship to their fantasy whoa uh yeah. whew. that was comprehensive what did you say about the resistance is that really cracked my skull just say it's like it's what he was saying in like other chapters it's like the closer you get to the nucleus or like uh, to knowing of the subject the more the the resistance is strengthened so it's like and oh so that just made me realize it's like the resistance is that's why he keeps going back to like why do they keep uh so the, the patient from before who talked about channel and read freud's work on uh jokes like what he keeps going back to why is it like the meta psychological element at this point plays into it it's because it's like the resistance is come to almost like envelop yeah. the ego and envelop themselves by bringing in this meta level the meta keep aspect mind. of it yeah so, keep in mind we haven't got into death drive yet that's seminar two but it's like all this will fit in once we get into these broader concepts and we're getting so lost in that we forget like oh there's these other elements like Jouissant's death drive that will play into these this, is, the it, it, this is so pivotal it's the and it's so hard to articulate. I have these flashes of realizing it, but it's when like one discourse, what he says, the slope of one discourse slides into another where it, 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 it kind of, it envelops itself. And that's the thing that's so easy for the analyst to miss because it's like, that's the whole thing with today with ego psychology. It's like kind of, hey, I've, this is the thing you keep doing again and again. And it has the 
appearance, the semblance of a kind of repetition, but it is not death drive. It, it's like, just to stop doing it. Now that I told you that you do this thing, you can stop doing it. Yeah. No, and it's but, kind of like, yeah. or, or what will people do? One or the other, I used to do this and now I don't do it. Or they'll say, I'm this kind of personality. That's why I do this thing. I can't help it. But it's like, the fact is what he's trying to say is like a little bit of knowledge is very dangerous in the sense that it can really sabotage the progress of the treatment in the sense that it's like knowing something about what you do and who you are, the interpretation itself, it doesn't matter what the contents of the interpretation is. It doesn't matter how spot on the interpretation is. It's the application of the interpretation in this kind of like practical yeah. way is where we go wrong because the discourse switches to another one and you didn't notice. Exactly. And they, it's like, that could also be due to the counter-transference, whether we're talking about psychoanalytic, um, you know, therapist or just some someone in ego psychology, like ego therapy, self help therapy, whatever it is. Like, and this is the thing. It's like yes, we don't want to counter transfer or whatever, but it's sometimes like when they're showing this resistance and they try to attack your character or say, "Oh, you really don't know anything," or like they just like. Uh, because again, the deeper the resistance to it's like there becomes this like like a diminishing of or like slowly decaying of this line or border of love and hate to where they kind of bounce back and forth from the transference by by this patient. Be vulnerable in a sense because you, th this is the discourse where you are not the master. And, and if you so long as you try to assert your dominance as the master, in most cases, Sometimes it may be okay, but let's not get excited, right? When he says, like, you know, it's where like the analyst realizes that, like, he's yeah, yeah, being an idiot in some cases, yeah, maybe the transference could help or the counter transference could help, but it's like, don't get it too excited or addicted to doing this because all you just do is allow that patient just to cling on you more and 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 use you as a cathexis a libidinal investment in your own yeah fire. It, it's man I, I have to clip what you said before with uh sublation off hey bung because it there was something you said about resistances that put it so perfectly but anyway uh you know i don't know if we should go line for line here because it, it's a little scattered the way he explains this and it's somewhat tough to explain, but it's also not all that complicated. And I'll try not to like trip over my my own words here. Yeah. And figure out a good way to explain what he's talking about. But it's it's almost like we're getting at the genesis of the ego. And this is this is really yeah. important because I I don't know, you know, I was surprised by the uh, paucity of text that there are commenting on this right here because it feels like Verneinung and uh, Beahung, which we're going to deal with a little bit later on, these two concepts really are at the very inception of the subject and the ego and the split that we're, that is, is going to characterize the split subjectivity. And, uh, you know, as the lecture I listened to with Supansic puts it, you know, the, the birth of thinking, like the beginning of thinking, essentially. And it's a very radical idea that it, well, it, it, it has to do with like introjection and expulsion. Yes. Right. And negation at that level, first, we can say, corresponds to a, I don't want to call it di dichotomy, but a dyad of two different kinds of judgment, judgments of attribution and oh. existence. I and, think, no, I think you're right but, about that. I, I think that that would be appropriate to say. But they're intertwined though. Yeah, you have, it, that's, uh, that's the point of the split. It's not like they're two different existences that actually just split they're one in this, it's like one thing split and that's what makes, there's a gap, but because of the split, they have this like distinction, but they determine each other. 
So what, what's fascinating about it, so, so we have these judgments of attribution and judgment of existence, and I'll, I'll try to explain what the difference is here, if I said them even correctly, but I think they also correspond to, and I'm going out on a limb here because I'm not sure about this, but I think they also correspond to, the, go, this goes back to Plato, this very uh, fundamental distinction between like uh, uh, the predicates and um, existence, right? Like a, uh, the, I, the copula, like the is yeah. of predication and the is of identity, essentially. Yeah, and, and I mean, you, you brought up Plato and when they're talking about the genesis of, of the unifying drive of, of love tendance, you know, love, you should think of Plato anytime they not only talk about judgment, but like love or just the fact of like the working through and the remembering this reminiscence that's platonic right there. And, and we'll get into this more in sem the beginning of seminar two because Plato's dialogue with the Minos brought up. So you see that psychoanalysis has the platonic form of the working through, but just not in its content. It's not trying to find these archetypes or these forms like in the way that Jung would try to freaking disavow. But... Right. Um, my bad. I'm just. I, I, I'm. I feel like we're we're both very absorbed in this, and it's like, all right. Let's see if we can go back to the very core of this and try to explain it simply. So, the formation of the ego, right? Freud has this brilliant idea of like introjection, which is that basically everything that the subject which we could read as the individual in a sense takes in the individual orga orgasm, orga organism. <laughs> and Freudian slip. <laughs> yo, that's a, it, well, that's what he's saying. Jouissance is the essence of yeah. human beings. It's kind of like an orgasm. Yeah. But you take in elements of the world, aspects of outside, of, what are outside of yourself, your perception that you say are good and that because they're good belong to you this is kind of the series of identifications that ends up layering the ego if yeah it, if, it, if it's good it belongs to you it's taken in i want it inside of me do with that what you will um but and if it's bad i expel it you and know? that's like like it's it's so simple but like it's, it's so um worded just pretentious over here like but i guess that's the point of just reading this you know there is these are heavy intellectual contenders they're heavyweights but yeah that's like that's very i mean i would have to read more freud to see if freud himself says this i would imagine because they're talking about freud but and that language that she used is kleinian is very much like you know i expel what's bad and i take in what's good this identification this and also the, the point of splitting comes more it's very emphasized by Klein, and we got to see it's like with lacan and his therapeutic aspect he's bouncing between the Kleinian and freudian he's definitely a freudian but there's some aspects that kind of work well to amplify freud from Klein, and we'll see this in the next chapter definitely so it's like Essentially, now there, but the important thing is not just the ego, but the distinction between inside and outside. Yeah, and and that's definitely a phenomenological thing too. The right was it the the inwell versus the umwell. Right, it's like the idea is like what's outside is bad, what's external to me is bad, and what's internal is good but we can't operate like that as adults right as like a real ego we can't so he talks about this pleasure ego which is uh you know a accorded to yes. the pleasure principle i would say what so sorry i would say like what you were saying like what what's outside is bad and what's inside is good it's only the fact is what is outside uh is what's outside is bad only if it disrupts the fantasy that I have about it. Okay, but before before we get to that, though, that's very true. But I should also say, you know what? 
there, uh, there is no inside outside distinction yet. That's the problem. Yes. Using that kind of language. Let's start over. I introject what's good. I expel what's bad. It's just introjection, expulsion. There is as of yet no inside okay. outside. No, yeah. There is no outside even perception that like we have to match up with our inside presentations. Because Got it. Yeah. In, that would imply a distinction between inside and outside. The question is, how do we form an ego that allows for an inside and outside where it's not just like, a, well, it is like a complete alternation between bad and good, but it's like, mm -hmm. uh, how do we form that a gap between yeah. inside and outside and allow for what Freud calls reality testing because we're always doing this we're testing without even realizing it we're testing our inner presentations or representations against what we see out our perception what we see outside of ourselves and we have to do that it that's what science is in many ways and we have to do that sometimes even consciously we're like wait am i seeing what i'm seeing yeah. you know so it's like i i, I see you right now i turn i see the, like I, these are all familiar settings if i'm somewhere new you know, I have to pay closer attention. And yeah, just like, like you're new to a job and like you have to pay close attention to it before you start to get comfortable and you're just like, yo, you know, you don't have to do this like the right way. Like I'm sure you a shortcut of how to do like teaching the new guy, like how to do whatever task, like the most minimalist way without doing it like to the corporate guidelines, but still getting it done and productive. I, 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 so that's the, uh, yeah. the like- From reality to, to pleasure. Apple, yeah version of it but also just at the very basic level of i'm in a new country i if i see something that i i can't even I, like what is that mm -hmm. what, am I, what am i looking at but sometimes you have to try you, you're so you have to match that with something that is a, a previous representation right yes this is all there's nothing too revolutionary about that and this is where it gets difficult yeah. well yeah. Yeah, just rest assured, like you're the, what there's questions that you're asking, like at least like what you're trying to aim at, uh, definitely is going to get answered in the whole optical schema. So, yeah, I'm gonna that balls, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna just add anything. I just want to say it's like that balls in rest your assured, head. you will get your answers there because you're already alluding, like you're way ahead, like you like the way you're already speculating. It's like okay, you're going above and beyond from what's showing right because you're realizing what's being left out so but the, the idea is that and this is the fascinating insight by freud and this is what Hippolyte is like astonished by mm -hmm. and to this day it's very astonishing it's a, you know i'm sure like uh Locke or any of the empiricists would have some variation on this notion of like reality testing as like oh so you saw a tree and you get the basic form of the tree and you kind of record that in your mind. And then next time you come on the tree, you're like, oh yeah, leaves, basic outline. Okay, mm -hmm. matching it up. Freud says, no, no, you are refinding an object when you're doing reality testing. You mm -hmm. aren't just dipping into your store of, of various images and matching. You're constantly refinding an object. So all reality testing, and again, that's matching your presentation in your mind to a present perception, all reality testing is a form of refinding an object, which is, in a sense, it's gone, but you're also testing to see if it's still there. And this is a really hard concept to get your mind wrapped around. You know, this is something that like is very Merleau Ponty like that. I'm getting I'm getting Merleau Ponty vibes from. But no, yeah, he says it, and you know what? I need to lob lob it in his court here because like they're gosh, I, I should be better prepared with this. Uh, he has a good way of of putting it and it's funny because you know i have to say as poor of a job as i'm doing of trying to explain it if elite's not doing too much better <laughs> no it's not the best organized he's under pressure he's, got, he's like lacan just said he's like yeah my, my, my boy right here could could uh vouch for this text and he's like i'll bet like what the fuck 
I got hung over with too much wine. I probably had like freaking three three females in my freaking hotel last night. <laughs> and, like, didn't study the text. <laughs> and let's be honest, these guys were constantly hung over. Come on, they're drinking, they're yeah. drinking Gerard Depardieu. Yeah. Volume. Didn't have my cigar yet. They don't allow us to smoke in this room. <laughs> so he said, okay, so let's let me let me let him explain it a little bit with this footnote here. Uh what does he say? Um, it is of no importance if whether something exists or doesn't exist. The subject reproduces its presentation of things from the primitive perception it had of them. Now, when he says that this exists, the question is not one of knowing whether this presentation still preserves its state in reality, but if it can or cannot be refound. Yeah. And I'm going to say it now, I'm going to quote Freud which is, I, I love his uh, gift for concision here compared to all these guys. The first and immediate aim, therefore, of reality testing is not to find an object in real perception, which corresponds to one presented, but to refine such an object, to convince oneself that it is still there. Yes. And it's that still there part that to me is like revolutionary. Yeah. If it's still there, it is not this novelty of experience. And like you're saying, this explains fantasy. Mm -hmm. Fantasy is not about discovering new things. And like, it's not what you hear from, you know, like mainstream accounts of it, where it's just like, oh, and you know, like a fantasy can be like such a wonderful Disney kind of thing. It's about discovering what's still there. Yeah. It's like, yo, like we we left this era. We're in a technocratic society, but we want to give you this fantasy of like, yo, are the castles and the queens and the kings still there? We still got this royalty, this 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 uh, triad relationship of the the king, queen, and 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 the you know child supposed to be, you know the the narcissistic relationship of them finding their purpose and then coming back to the the triad. And it, it's it's just it. This harmonious triad, I should say. I keep like apologizing for us, but it's it's really hard to lay this out. Uh, you could, like do so much with this. Like I guess that's probably why like, there's so much philosophical importance to this. So I want to get back to the main thread uh, as soon as we can. I'm glad we didn't go through this line for line, but. He says something really fascinating here, which is that, you know, he's, uh, Hippolyte is anticipating death drive here in this description, but he doesn't quite know it. But uh, he talks about the instinct of destruction from a Hegelian point of view and the pleasure principle. And he seems kind of like befuddled at like what he's even talking about. Uh, but, it, it, you know, this goes back to Fort Da. Mm -hmm. which Lacan talks about in Function and Field. Of course, the famous uh, game with the toy on the string uh, from uh, uh, Beyond the Pleasure Principle. And what's fascinating here is he talks about uh, the fundamental attitude of symbolicity rendered explicit. So there's something about the symbolic, there's something about speech and language and the death drive at play here and the formation of the ego. And he's confused himself about what non-being and being have to do with this. He says, a margin of thought can be generated, an appearance of being in the form of non-being, which is generated with negation. That is to say, when the symbol of negation is linked up with the concrete attitude of negation. Now, I don't know about attitude, but Supanchis is going to talk about how right now we're witnessing the birth of the unconscious in the sense that it comes about with a, a no, even though there is no no, as he says, in the unconscious. So the split comes about with a no, maybe later that could be the name of the father, the no of the father, prohibition. And yet within the unconscious, there is no no. So yeah. the negation of the negation 
that is implicit in the that is not my mother that is my mother the dialectic there refers to the unconscious refers to a split refers to a cut primordial cut and yet it, you know through the negative we enter the realm we're not enter the realm but like we are uh, referred to the unconscious which doesn't know negation that's the yeah. thing thing Yeah, it's not that there is no negation, but it just doesn't know it. So in a sense, it's just always like, that's where the Alham comes in. It, it, it's just knows how to affirm, like, this is just the reoccurrence. And, and you'll see this more in like seminar 11, where he formulates the fact that like, the unconscious is like temporarily appearing and then reappearing in like certain moments like it's just it's just weird like how like over time you see how Lacan just like talks about the unconscious but right here we just see this description so far as this like all right yeah it it doesn't know negation but yet there's this like affirmation of something or of its appearing it right so and that it has to do with this failure to recognize mechanosense, which yeah. is related to in what what I like is this uh, connection here between mechanosense and connoissance knowledge, which is it, it's not the, the same uh, root. It doesn't exist in English, yeah. but in French we have it's something kind of like. Um, to fail to recognize is like non-knowledge. Yes, and he will apply this to the mirror stage for the fact that the connaissance is a misrecognition because of our, we know a mastery of our body, which is a failed knowing. It's false mastery or it's, it's false knowledge. It's, it's the fact that we believe that we have this, I should say, this false sense it's not false knowledge it's just the perception that is a false perception mm -hmm. um because we think that we have mastery over our body because in the mirror stage this reconnaissance takes a place when we have this fragmented image of our body which we identify with right and in this case what's fascinating is when you link this first attempt to symbolize with the mirror stage you get two halves of pretty much i think kind of the the same process here and it's this failure to recognize which could also be thought of as a, a failure to know which ultimately characterizes this and he's quoting freud here in a negative formula, it's the hallmark of the possibility of being in possession of the unconscious and refusing it all the while. And this is the whole thing about the unconscious and consciousness that it's so difficult to grasp. And this is why I think so many people are turned off by psychoanalysis because it just feels like uh, so many paradoxes. And yet it isn't just uh, playing with paradoxes for paradox's sake. It's playing with paradoxes to force something else to emerge. And it's always a, a third term, a third participant. And this is something that is being emphasized here, which is that there's so much here. That's why it's so hard to focus on one thing. But yeah, let's take a look at the way Lacan illustrates it and or just uh, elaborates on this with some some examples that aren't immediately uh that don't immediately explain it but well before we do that to bring it back to verneinung to bring it back to the original moment of negation that is not my mother it's like what the hell would any of that have to do with the formation of the ego and introjection and uh, expulsion. The fact is, it's like there is this mythical moment, 
and it's a mythical moment where you pass over into a another sort of stage where suddenly you are a fully formed ego, not just this pleasure ego, and there is an inside and outside. And that can't occur unless you have entered the symbolic order, right? But in entering the symbolic order, you aren't uh, suddenly incorporated into this sort of constellation of just like positive particles, like you, it, it has to do with this um, negation affirmation process that helped form you and form the outside world, this inside and outside. So for Freud, the red flag of the unconscious here is when you deny something voluntarily without being prompted to and in that case and there are other examples which we'll talk about with the wolfman or when you say like you know i didn't think that i didn't ever think of that what's happening there is what is revealed in these moments is the split or the cut that constitutes the unconscious and this cut or split, and this is why it has to do with sexual difference, this cut or split or fissure, or whatever you want to call it, it's not just that, that it's a cut between two entities. Okay, you've got the unconscious on one end, consciousness on the other end. They're not the same. And okay, the, cut, the gap is just a gap between the two. It's also that, and this is Zizek's whole thing, this is Supontius's whole thing, the gap itself constitutes its own reality so there can't be an inside and an outside without a gap most people would agree with that but what you could miss there is that the gap itself is a third thing nothing it's very hard to put into words but the thing is the difference between mother and not mother it's not just that there's a difference between the two or that mother and not mother are cross contaminated it's that when you say well that's not my mother you're alluding to the existence of a third thing which is the yeah. gap and it is that gap which allows for there to be an inside and an outside because there's always this what, what is not the subject and the object there must be a third thing which is not the subject and the object and what's the name for that I mean, it would it's, have to be, yeah, just like, I would say like the language of it, but it's not to say that's a meta language, but the fact that there just has to be some mediation of it. And, and I think that's kind of the whole critique of object relations as well, because it does focus on subject object. It's alluding to this other third thing without naming it. And I think that's what, what Lacan wants to get at too. Well, I think the name for it, which I, I don't know if he's applied it yet, is drive, though. Mm -hmm. And drive is that gap. And yes. this is the thing that it's so difficult to get uh, well, yeah. a, a binary giant wrap around it, but it, that, that something can exist that is neither subject nor object. Mm -hmm. And it is that sort of a, a, a nothing or a nothingness that is going to more it's the real it's woman there's so many names for it but that is going to be a, a principal factor that can't quite be characterized yeah in his philosophy now lacan here is going to take up his argument and very calmly very placidly it, unlike myself now uh sort of lay out and unfold what exactly is talking about again i think it's really funny because ippolite like th this is what i love about these seminars is they to me they feel like platonic dialogues and that like they, they do yeah. people in the room and like these are real characters there this is a, a a set there there's someone sitting here they seem you know just like intellectuals always are like 
trying to impress each other, but like yeah. terrified of embarrassing themselves. And like, you can, you can feel that, you know, you yeah. can feel Hippolyte like wanting to impress Lacan here. It's, it's a cipher. Everybody's doing their braggadocio. <laughs> and Lacan is Nas, basically, I would say. Like, just complete equanimity, you know? Just, he understands his level of ability. So and- we're saying that the Lacan seminars are the firm, then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so Lacan is Nas. Um, AZ, in this case, is Hippolyte. <laughs> Not, <laughs> AZ is Hippolyte. Z is not AZ, though. Z is... Well, there's the original firm, which was like a, you got the Fox, right? You had the well, you had Foxy Brown, Foxy Brown, Nas, yeah. Cormega, and AZ were the original firm, but then the firm album was like it was, I think it was Nas, AZ, Nature, and Jungle, mm. and then like that, Na- Nature is Nas's brother, and then Jungle's. Yeah someone else from QB so I actually never listened to that I just know the firm from the affirmative action song on the was it uh it was fire. yeah it was written or was it Illmatic it was written it was written yeah that song is that song is yeah, fire that's a banger that's hilarious the the, the firm is here yeah. <laughs> firm <laughs> is though that's a good song <laughs> so okay so he thanks people lead here comes back to Bea Hung and there's also something else that should be pointed out here that he puts beautifully is this notorious opposition between the intellectual and the affective. This to me goes right back to um, the like therapy culture that we have today, which is that like you have this sort of uh, unprocessed like raw like almost like the like fossil fuels of emotion that just need to be released into the atmosphere and that they just exist as an, as an undercurrent on their own that just exist like you're just it's society that creates this layer that you need to penetrate and let it out discharge it come on cry and it's like that's what he's describing right here the yeah, like catharsis yeah it's complete like narcissism but like the affective were a sort of coloration a kind of ineffable quality which must be sought out in itself independently of the eviscerated skin which is a purely intellectual realization because for Lacan just as for Freud even if Freud didn't call it a signifier an affect is always attached to an idea or a signifier right yes yeah always there's no there, uh, affects do not exist on their own no 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 and, they, and yeah Otto Kernberg is very different but he would say the same thing in reverse though he would say that drives don't exist on their own that drives actually okay. come after affects in the um in the affects themselves it's like the baby has affects rather than just like this raw libido in the Freudian sense whereas like for Freud it's libido drives he's saying it's affects and then drives come after so it's like this relationship between the drives and the affects it's like chicken versus the egg but it's like we should just know that they both are the contention and that they both somehow exist imminently what what do you think of that though do you, do you think uh the i i don't know that i can't re- remember the name of the guy you just mentioned but do you think he has a point there i, I would say that the drives do have more precedence that the affects more it's not that they don't have precedence at all but something that's affective in drives i would say that it comes a lot later like it doesn't mean like this baby is like emotionless but rather drives act as a conduit for affects he would say the latter and he definitely act, he writes more in a medical way compared to like Freud and, and Lacan where like they speak in a more like for an audience of sorts but or at least even though Lacan's difficult he's accessible to people that are just interested in his theory where Otto Hungberg is a psychiatrist so he's writing for a medical audience maybe that's why he probably put affects first maybe drives are too metaphysical right because most uh clinicians as i understand it at 
the time of the release of the uh, Beyond the Pleasure Principle had rejected the notion of death drive as ridiculous. And that's why you don't see somebody like Jung use that because he wants to make, even though he calls it analytical psychology, he's an analyst. He's just like wanting to disavow that master signifier and trying to make, and like he's a fact simp because he literally calls the ego a fact and it's a psychic fact. He doesn't give it its due as far as, or he, he doesn't not give it its due, like he doesn't like expose it. Like he sees it as something given. Even though he'll call it a persona, it's something that we show to the social, and then we reject these, like, you know, so called um, things that are unwanted by society, and we repress them into the shadow. So, like, the unconscious in Freud is like the shadow, but then you have just the collective unconscious as well. It's just like the total nine yards of the whole cringe reality, but it's like, I think Freud is definitely more sophisticated in his metapsychology compared to Jung because he just tried to disavow so much of psychoanalysis trying to make analytic psychology a fact. Yeah, and it seems like Freud's only error in discovering the death drive, other than errors, which doesn't make much sense, but uh, was that he died too soon after discovering the death drive. Yeah. That was the mistake he made because it's like, had he known via Lacan and now, and of course, uh, again, Slavoj, who makes it a central feature of his whole philosophy, yes, like yeah, the death drive would, and it is, but it is metaphysical, but not in the traditional sense of philosophy. And that's what we just discovered in Ippolit's analysis of it is it's like metaphysical, but it also challenges the whole notion of metaphysics. And yes. that's what I wanted to bring up before, which is something that Alenka Zupancic talks about is that it also challenges the, again, the, the fundamental philosophical notions that uh, are like seen as the cornerstones of all philosophical thinking, the principle of non-contradiction and the law of the excluded middle. Which and this is, this is why yeah. Todd McGowan would say that if Freud was alive or if Hegel was alive during around the time of psychoanalysis, that he would be a psychoanalyst himself. Interesting. Yeah. Because yeah. of that. Because that's what Hegel was trying to not subscribe with in his dialectic. And that, you know, that just makes Hegel all the more impressive because the yeah. fact that he was able to like figure this shit out without actually like talking to a person about it, yeah. just reading Kant and being like, you know, because my first impression of Hegel, uh, and this is like what a lot of people say about like all the post-Kantian all post-Kantian transcendentalists uh, is that like, oh, well, they all misinterpreted the idea of the noumena. Noumena is just a limit. And it's like, you have Schelling and Fichte and it's like, they just expand it and they like kind of disregard the, um, you know, uh, constraints that he puts on his own system and like go buck wild with it supposedly and people accuse hegel of doing the same thing but it's really but the opposite it's yeah. the opposite it's like no and this is what zizek points out and i would have never known this were it not for zizek it's kind of like no kant didn't follow through on his own principles to the maximal degree like hegel did and that's the genius of hegel is being like, I think that's also because like of his things like when he's talking about ethics and then even the aesthetics like I just don't see him falling into play these limits of knowledge because like how could you say there's limits to reason but then you want to talk about something as sublime as sublimity itself or like the aesthetic or as categorical as the goodwill And yeah. I'm not trying to get into philosophy right now because we're talking about Lacan, but yes, like I could see that in that sense. I wish Todd McGowan was here to uh, school us on this, but yeah. um, no, the McGowan last is yeah, he's our master signifier right now. Absolutely. Tom's but the last there. thing I wanted to say is that like what's fascinating about it from Ippolit's perspective is that it throws both of those 
uh, fundamental ideas out of whack because it's like you have the um, principle of non-contradiction and I might be getting them mixed up and you know what, fuck it, it doesn't matter. But like the principle of non-contradiction is like if P then not F and then I think the law of the excluded middle is either F is true or p is true yeah pretty much saying it's like either or has to be the case like that's aristotle's metaphysics right there it's like you can't have both equal or both being not both being are like they, like one has to be either or but like uh like yeah it's like either this is the case and this is not the case or vice versa but like it's like you just can't have both being true and and, and false at the same time because one of them is like if this is true this is false yeah or uh this either this is true or this is true and those are two different oh, really? laws and it's like in this case what what like freud's discovery is is that like yeah in conscious logical everyday life that's true in the unconscious nay like that's yeah it's then it's like whoa what the fuck but um anyway uh, let's just we'll wrap things up here and it gets a little complicated we have our first mention of ver where fung yeah, foreclosure but let's not get too excited here because we're not talking about psychosis yet no. we're still in the neurotic structure yeah wolf, and, and, and let's also know, talk about the wolf clarification wolf. that as far as symptoms wise, you could have somebody who is neurotic and can have these like hallucinations, like a psychotic, but the structures of the discourse are still neurotic. And in the same way, you could have somebody who's suffering from psychosis, but yet they could have their own oedipalization. They could have their own fixations on certain things, but the structure of discourse makes it psychotic. This is something that is actually also revolutionary to Lacan. Yeah, I remember um, Derek Hook has a video about that where it's like diagnosis. And he says the same thing. He's a Lacanian analyst himself. And he says like, you can't, just because someone has a hallucination, you can't jump to conclusions about them being a psychotic. And just because someone might exhibit obsessive behaviors, you can't jump to the conclusion that person is a neurotic obsessive either yeah so i I really like these examples of we had this uh anecdote that the wolf man related to freud where he at some point i forget what he's doing exactly but he hallucinated that what he did cut his he did actually cut his finger right yeah yeah he cut his finger and then he hallucinated that he he had cut his finger so deeply that it hanged only by a little piece of skin Mm -hmm. and uh, he's overwhelmed by a feeling of catastrophe he's terrified he doesn't uh, even talk about it to the person next to him yeah and then when he looks at it again right it's suddenly reconstituted itself yeah well the thing is like i think you said something that he didn't experience castration but it's weird because like you know him like the rat man he came from a middle class family and so he had nannies and governesses and he actually rebelled like and like wanted to be like you know very active and mischievous when he was a kid to his governess and so he whips out his fucking schlong and just <laughs> And she's like, you better put that away because boys that act bad get their things cut off and that scared him. So that was like kind of like the whole thing of him in a sense having that fear of castration. Right. Yeah. So he, yeah. So uh, Freud and Lacan, of course, related to the castration complex, but also a... uh, absence of the genital plane for him so it's also like a um a aborted uh edipal- yeah. oedipization in a sense too right and 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 i think there's that abortion of that that specific plane is because his parents never really showed him affection 
and he had more connections with the governess there are females of course and then his sister but it was like in this dynamic of the family a lot of people said that's like the way how he was so obedient but yet the way his sister acted had more wits and acted more assertive it was like they should be the opposite sex it's like the wolf man you should have been born a woman and your sister should have been born a man so there was kind of like that dynamic as well that which affected him and the fact that like according to analysis like there wasn't that like par excellence castration but at the same time there was this like effect and complex of a castration or like because of the whole absence of a general plane because he didn't get that kind of Oedipal rebellion and assertiveness of his phallic development of libido where you felt like he could rebel to his fa father like in a Hamlet type of way. Well, it, it's interesting you mentioned Hamlet because uh, I know like Zuponsa talks about the Hamlet. Yeah, the, this kind of like acting out, right? Mm -hmm. And that uh, hallucination is something similar to yeah. acting. Although yeah, although the Wolfman does act out like when he's, oh, I forget what his age is. He's definitely far older, but like his birthday is like kind of like closer to like Christmas. So like he's supposed to, he was expecting two gifts, but he only gets gifts for like one of the holidays. And so he throws wow. a fit. Yeah, he throws a fit. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> expecting more gifts. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> what a prima donna. But, uh, Sweet 16. This is a form of acting out. Uh, well, okay, actually, I shouldn't say that, but it's something akin to acting out, which is hallucination. But we're talking about externalizing something. So think about the outside inside distinction that we were talking about before uh, uh, with Verneinung of like, how do you make something present by denying it? How do you? not see what you see. And that's the fascinating thing here that's so hard to grasp. And again, Slavoj talks about this when, you know, the funny thing is we all hallucinate all the time and we don't think anything of it. You might think you see something sometimes and it's like, I think I saw a cat, but it's just a yeah. plastic bag. That's hallucination. There are prolonged hallucinations. And then there's something like that where you realize, and this is something Zizek points out, that um, and, and it probably has to do with disavowal too, which is that maybe you don't actually know how things really seem to you. Well, and, and that's funny that you bring that up in disavowal because this is the way I explained to Lex because like, I guess we would, I would identify as atheists, you know, and she would do so as well um, in a sense not like cringe, like Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, Dawkins type atheists where we just argue Christians, but like, look at Christmas, for example, like, of course there are families that will still celebrate Christmas, not because they believe it's the birth of Christ. Although when somebody like questions, like what's the meaning of Christmas? If they don't say it's the spirit of giving, it's like, oh, it's when, you know, Christ was born. But if they definitely, you know, don't, uh, circumscribed to that belief system be like well there'll be like a, a Huey Newton like you know Jesus was black Ronald Reagan was the devil and they'll talk about like <laughs> Jesus was born in the spring not in the winter because he would have died like type shit and uh just totally just like you know just destroy their belief system but then they'll disavow it it's just like well if that's the case we still gonna celebrate Christmas just because it just brings the family together and just makes me happy, which is something that actually happens when you actually question things, especially because you know you have that family member who's the Grinch, you know, who's always like gonna be at the party, but it's gonna ruin it for everybody because they're just like, you know, uh, angry or just spiteful. Whether or not they have that articulation, there's always gonna be that person and they're just like, smile more, the family's here type thing. And they'll be like, well, Christmas is meaningless. What's the point of it? Why can't we just give every day? It's just like, well, 
your grandma couldn't make it or this this that and the third it's it's like that's the disavow it's like you're not answering the fact like what's the point of this spirit of giving when you could do it every day why does it have to be this day or why are you using jesus you could do this that and third to prove the existence of jesus or the purpose of jesus christmas you're like reifying the utility of your fantasy and perverse like making it more perverse and i just want to point out that like what's going on right now isn't technically disavowal for the wolf man it's their werefung right it's yeah foreclosure it's but there there's there's similarities here for sure uh you know these are all like you know as dr Derek cook would say like these are all ways of coping with the the real yeah. essentially coping. these are all coping thing. mechanisms for of for the real but as lacan puts it beautifully here what is not recognized erupts into consciousness in the form of the scene and this is great and this is where like all the conversation we've been having um the example you just gave of christmas which is great and every like i feel like zizek's whole political philosophy so much hinges on this because it's like we assume when we don't like something when we're against something that we want it to go away but the more we're against it the more we externalize it and you would think well if i don't want to see something i want it to go away i hide my eyes i make it non-visual it's like actually when you don't want to see something you see it all the more but in a preferred form is the thing. And that could be That's his thing about toilets. Yeah, exactly. That's, yeah. <laughs> the three toilets. The French, the German, and the Anglo-Saxon. <laughs> and that, what that's all about sublation, right? It's like yeah. <laughs> different styles of sublation. So the thing is, that's the whole point. So we never make anything truly go away. And when you don't like something, supposedly, you're probably you're all the more obsessed with it in preserving it than when you're like let's say indifferent to something that's when you truly are indifferent to something but what's interesting here though and Zupanchit uh, pointed this out to me is that it's not just the, the hallucination that he has but also the way it's framed is even more fascinating because and Lacan doesn't say this here. I and I don't know where she got this from, but you know, there, it's this déjà vu thing, or I think it's like déjà raconté, because the French have like different categories for this, which I think is so cool. Not just seeing something or feeling something, but also like I, I feel like I told you this before. There's a phrase for that, which is déjà raconté. I think is the phrase. But it, what's fascinating is like apparently when the Wolfman says this talks about this he's like didn't i already tell you this because freud's like i don't remember you ever telling me this he's like no i already told you and that's when i feel like i have a lot of those that well deja vus, but like i feel like i've told you this before i'm sure i told which is much more calm it's much it's yeah. less surreal because you're like no nah, i told you that it's like no nah, yeah. i didn't he's like I told you that. so it's this retrospective illusion so it's not just what happened but also the the way it's framed there's this kind of uh as Zupancha puts it like a redoubling yes experience yes. um but again it's almost like you're lobbing it back to the analyst in that sense mm -hmm. you, you're putting it on the shoulders of the analyst be like hey you deal with this because i already told you this man this is my thing like i already told you this yeah and it's like, like it's not my problem bro it's, it's like this is your problem you're the one treating me dude <laughs> and it's like you figure this out and it's fa fascinating because there's this constant kind of what lacan points out this dialectic and we saw it with uh, in the previous chapter with the ego and the other with the the whole channel thing which is like oh okay i got a joke for you you like jokes here's a joke for you that you'll like this one kind of yeah. and it's kind of appealing to the analyst that like oh i understand how this science works i get it I, I read some books like i know what you're doing kind of thing and that's also a part of this sort of process of well no that yeah but that was actually interesting yeah it's like yo yo like uh that that 
I did my part. Like I already told you. And like, you know, I, I, I remember saying this before you don't remember. So that's on you that, you know, that's your, you need to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and do your <laughs> like type of thing. Like for real though, like that's literally what it's. Yeah. Like. Yeah. No, you don't bust your gun. You're not a real yeah. analyst, you know, <laughs> like, you're capping. You're capping. You're capping. Come on. The session ain't busting. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, and that's going to happen. That's what, like, an, he's saying that's what an analyst has to deal with. Yeah. And when you're like, guess what? This is what you're actually doing, bro. Crack the code. It's kind of like, that's when you're the most <laughs> vulnerable to fucking up. Because you're, you, you know, that's the counter transference right there. Because it's like, you're in love with uh, your own interpretation, your own ability to interpret, you know? can be a thing that he's saying like watch out for and here it's he said he puts it beautifully here you can miss this but like the intellectualized sterilization of contents revoked by analysis right it, they become subsequently intellectualized brought back into the fold of the uh subject psychic life such that they the ego remains like intact so just to finish it there's this i don't know this guy is chris uh he has this interesting article that uh, he cites where it's a really interesting case like this uh analyst chris had this uh an alizan the subject who was experiencing all manner of difficulties producing he's an academic he's trying to write but he feels like uh, he's a plagiarist. He's convinced that no matter what he does, none of his ideas are original and that he's plagiarizing. And he uh, has like a lot of brilliant scholar friends and he's discussing his ideas. And he finally manages to like, just momentarily overcome his feelings of inadequacy and writes a paper, but of course, as you'd expect, he discovers that, like, in his mind, you know, it's already all the content in his uh, paper is like all has already been written. And once yeah. again, he feels like uh, a plagiarist. So Chris brings it back to, of course, the, the edible level and says that uh, he needs to find. You know, it's it's because of his father, of course, and that you know he his behavior is shackled because his father yeah. never succeeded, and uh, because his own father was crushed by his grandfather, and he feels that um, you know he would uh, find in his father a grandfather, someone who's great. If he believes in his father, in a sense, then um, he, he would be capable of doing something. And um, what he's been doing up until this point is creating uh, like superiors uh, that he cannot uh, match up with, who are always grander than him. And uh, he becomes dependent on them by casting himself as a plagiarist. And he's doing nothing more than satisfying a need. And Lacan says like, yeah, this is valid. This is a valid interpretation, but it's important to see how the subject reacted to it. So what does Chris consider as being the confirmation of the uh, significance of what he put forward, which has such tremendous implications? So it's always, you know, how can I test as an analyst that uh, like what I've said has, you know, had any effect? Um, so this is really interesting. It's it's weird and funny. I really like the way Lacan expresses it. Lacan is really bad at like just telling simple stories of like what yeah. happened. He's like terrible. At, he's, he's like so confusing because he puts these unnecessary details in there. He cannot just like keep it simple. Like I went, he, I, how would you, like, what did you do today, Lacan? It's like, he can't even, <laughs> he can't simply tell you what he did. What did you have for breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> he'd be like well the thing with breakfast is when you break your fast the, 
God damn it, man. All right. <laughs> See, even if I would have said I had scrambled eggs, it's like the way that I whisked them. The yeah, time. it's just like, and as we know with eggs and the yolk, <laughs> when they get like, it's like, all right, man. But uh, <laughs> uh, so this guy, I like it. I like the evocation of New York suddenly. I didn't expect that, but whoever, because uh, because he's always, you know, he's always ragging on like American analysts. He can be sure like half the time they're either British or American. Yeah. And he's like, um, the, the analysis the subject says, you know, uh, that uh, he went to New York and uh, let's imagine it's Chinatown. I don't know why it's like where you can eat rather more spicy dishes. So he wants like, he wants some uh, Szechuan, you know? Yeah. Like I went to into such and such street and I sought out a place where I could find the dish I am particularly fond of, fresh brains. It's like, yeah. what? Fresh brains? now i didn't get this at first but i guess it like it has something to do with the brain you know like i don't know can you interpret the what the that that was weird i was like i thought it was like is it an association type thing like i mean then again it's chinatown like you go around and you see like a hanging duck or whatever no it's not actually i just made that up i don't know if it's actually chinatown but like I, I, i saw new york and my first my like when i saw spicy I was like, oh, man, like I'm thinking of the yeah. so that's just my own associations, but but it's like, where are they going if it's like fresh brains? Unless like it was like a, a pair of praxises or something like that. Well, what I what uh, based on like the plagiarism and a- academia, like to you, what does that metaphor say? Because I kind like, of I don't know, like it, it's definitely one of those things of from I think from the most part there was like a lot of like affirmation from this text that like we kind of clarified just by discussing it but even when i reread it like as far as like the notion of negation but like these just no, but little, i wanted no i just mean more like on the level of like basic metaphor like yeah what? like as far as this thing like this shit like it kind of confused me i'm like it like what is he getting at like it was weird it's his brain his I, i'm just saying before we yeah. get into the vernina it's like his brain is fresh now because of it could be, yeah. Yeah, like it, you know, he he was when he thought he was a plagiarist, he was seeking out the fresh brains of other people. His brains, not yeah, okay, yeah. That kind of thing. Just just on that level, I was trying to understand it, but um, you know, uh, so Lacan doesn't care so much about um, the accuracy of the. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, no. Towards the end, this one, this one kind of like. Yeah, could, like I confused the hell out of me. What, what's what's wrong with the? How is this similar to hallucination? Why is this for nine on? I mean, as far as it being for nine, does it have to associate with or, or correspond to some sort of hallucination? Hallucination for uh, particularly? No, but there's a similar structure oh. I think in place here, and I, I, mean, I wouldn't have understood it unless I. Um, listen to the um, Zupancic lecture, but I mean, at the same time, like, is he like, is he rejecting something though? I don't. It... How clear can you see make this possible is to accurate interpretation? There, there is an ob- objectification. I or think, or just have the implicit of of it a fresh brain maybe maybe he still implies that everybody else's brains are fresh and that he's not that's uh, with the whole plagiarism thing yeah that's the only part i miss because i feel like i i want to know how this guy chris it's, interpreted it exactly the crisscrossing of, of of the language it's like the crisscrossing of explicit and implicit meaning It's something like him see uh, the Wolfman seeing his finger mm-hmm. hanging off. I think, but I really I need to read this article because the question is, it's like, uh, yeah, like how did this Chris guy interpret mm-hmm. this? Instead, like he saw it as a, a a yeah, that's what he says. What is considered as being a confirmation. You know, and um, 
he sees it as the confirmation that this new knowledge is like kind of uh laid its roots suddenly in his patient's yeah. mind and that it's like uh li- like after that it's like what makes this an accurate interpretation um are we dealing with something at the surface what does it mean it means nothing other than that chris via a detour that is a doubtless diligent but whose outcome he could easily have uh predicted came to realize precisely the following that the subject in his manifestation in the special uh, guise of a production of an organized discourse in which he is always subject to this process which is called negation and in which the integration of the ego is accomplished can only reflect his fundamental relation to ideal ego in an inverted form. Inverted form. Are we talking about the ego ideal then? Or, oh, in the relation to the other, and so far as the primitive desire of that subject strives to manifest itself and contains and always contains itself in this fundamental. Sounds like we're getting close to the ego ideal or just another inversion of the, yeah, because the ego ideal should be the inversion of the ideal ego in which the ego, I, the ideal ego makes itself an object for the gaze of the other, for the other, for this this relation with the super hmm. ego. okay it's uh, so th- the inversion is the thing that's fascinating to me because it's taking the inside and, and putting it out there yes right? yes and and that's why like this ties into like your previous speculation when in your question you're foreshadowing something that i was like it's gonna get addressed in the very bouquet this again is a build up to a lot like it's like there's so much that it's like you can't help but question so much that it's like all right we're foreshadowing what's going to be involved in the next one it's like he perfectly sets up his seminars to be yeah left open like what are like i don't get it i still don't get it ah next seminar you're like okay that makes sense but only enough and it's like yeah <laughs> because the wolf man makes sense yeah, yeah. he's qu- he's giving you quilting points and it ends it here because he's with using- the wolf man we have a perfect inversion of something that isn't happening that does not pass the reality test of yeah. course, that he sees, which is, of course, this kind of dissolution between inside and outside, which it it would, would be expressive of a, um, you know, like an abortive partition between the inside and outside that goes back to what was like something like Verneinung, but even more severe in that it shows that it's like taking us right back to that sort of almost something like a pleasure ego of it's like an intermixing between an actual ego and a pleasure ego, I would think in that like the, you see the introjection expulsion thing at work, but in phenomena, phenomenologically. Yeah rather than, because that's like, that, that's, the whole psych, that's the whole psychosis, right? Is that it's like, you see that constant mm-hmm. alternation between a presence and absence that's con- that the subject is always trying to get hold of and control at, with, because there isn't a, a background, there isn't the breathing room that comes with just regular, if you wanna call it regular, but like neurosis. And uh, he's not a psychotic, but in that moment, because it the, like what happened spoke to something of metaphorical in his life that had never really come to term. He has this uh, hallucination. Um, now, this, this is why Lacan's brilliant, because then he like uh, once because I, I feel like yeah, the Wolfman is un- understandable, but then this incident is a, a much more enigmatic. But it has to do with something like an ob- objectification, I-, I would think. And like you said, and he brings up ideal ego for the first time. He hasn't said that before this point, I'm pretty sure. So the ideal ego, like you said, in an inverted form is the ego ideal, right? Yes. So his ego ideal is fresh brains. In a metal. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm like trying to associate there, like trying to formulate there. And fresh brains 
I don't think there is one, you know, univocal interpretation of what fresh brains means. It's very um, uh, polysemous, if it's polysemous, however you say that. It's like it, it, it there is, it, it, it's overdetermined, right? It could mean many things. His brain is fresh, their brains are, fresh. it doesn't matter so much, but it it's like channel, It like everything hinges on this, these two signifiers here. And, but is, is Lacan saying that uh, Chris's interpretation doesn't, doesn't do what, it should, or there isn't a real change, or there is. Is he yeah. is he applauding Chris for his? I don't think he's applauding. No, he never does. Yeah. So that's where we end. But mm -hmm. you know, kind of at a, at at an impasse. There's not much else here to say. Really, really difficult. Yeah. Passage. But however, like as far as like the meat of this essay now that we got through besides like towards the end with Chris, we will see a lot of at least what we were dissecting in the abstract being played out in the text with a lot of other cases. There are a couple of cases. And then of course, um, the questions that you were trying to formulate, which allude to something later on, like the inverted bouquet. So definitely we're going to get a lot of our questions asked at the same time we're going to get into a lot of great like theoretical experimental stuff yeah because the next one is uh ego psychology versus discourse or discourse analysis versus ego meaning melanie klein and anna freud and you see a lot of stuff that Lacan definitely really admires from Melanie Klein because when he got into psychoanalysis, I think he started more with Kleinian theory before he actually began his um, back to Freud, you know, maxim. And like, there is a lot wrong with Anna Freud, pretty much. Like, she is the I wouldn't say the, but like the main one that traces back to as far as like ego psychology and like just just like this little man within the man or the uh, mm -hmm. synthesizing of these symptoms and complexes into a healthy ego. The healthy ego is the yes, that's like yes. the real uh, misnomer. Yeah, and what's great is like you both. Like in both of them, you're getting examples of a case study. So we have a lot to work with. Now, this is cool because, um, right, so we're dealing with Lacan of the imaginary, of course. And here, he's just trying to uproot, I feel like, the weeds here of ego psychology. And hopefully, once you get the topic of the imaginary, I haven't read this far yet, but we're now we're going to get into Lacan proper, like, yeah, this is what little I, by little. yeah, and ego ideal, ideal ego, two narcissisms. I'm excited, man. I'm, I'm glad we got through this part, and hopefully the next, uh, the the next few chapters will be a little bit easier. Well, it'll be more clarifying than easy, but definitely not easy, not easy. Yeah, yeah. 